Uh, it's a parallelogram. <laughs> it's a parallelogram. It's a polygon. Yeah, it's a polygon. <laughs> it's in the rectangle family. It's in the rectangle family, Aaron. It has four 90 degree angles. Look at you. Half things. Should I pay more attention? Is it a 2D shape? Oh, oh, I said, said that. I said that. I want to say something about a cube, but you go. Okay, um, if you turn it, it could be a diamond. Yep. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Amazing. I don't know what I have to tell you. I wrote this down. It's shaped like <laughs> one caramel square. Love it. See, you're using, you're using your own chart. <laughs> <laughs> you're making connections. You're making connections. Um, you can divide it in half. And then it's a Divide it in half and then in quarters. That's what we'd say. Right. It has two sets of parallel sides. Two sets of parallel sides. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good for That's you. Right. Bring it, Christy. Don't forget, Christy. Oh, Christy. Sorry, Christy. That's okay. You're so quiet back there. Well, now I get to be last. <laughs> 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 Should have shut it out. I'm going to take it. Okay. Caitlin just told me to say it's not a circle. It's not a circle. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's all right. We were, we were with a bunch of high school teachers, and they were going on giving formulas and stuff like that. Oh. <laughs> but the neat thing about a question like this is it's an open-ended math journal question, but it's also for, like, in kindergarten right now and in grade one, you might have some kids that can't really write that in a math journal right now. So instead of doing journals in that kind of a format, you could have a discussion. You could have, like, circle time, talking about the shape, and then this way, if you provide it in this kind of a content, you could ask your lower-level learners first to give them what they know about the shape so that they feel like they're part of the group. So you should and then them first. That's what it's <laughs> That's why I let the kindergarten teachers go last is done. So then, um, anyway, so then they feel like they're part of the group and then your little smarty pants can keep working, trying to think more and more and more. So it's challenging with the higher level learners as well to try to come up with something different. So is there anybody that, well, if you don't want to make this one, but using math journals, if you don't feel comfortable with using math journals, I would love to come into your class. I'll start them up. I'll get them started. I'll model it. And I, I'd love to do that. So, if you, that's something for you to think about, Travis? I just wondered how long you should give a group when you assign the question. How long should you give them to write? Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. And it's usually at the end, and you know what, like when we're talking about formative assessment that should be done in the class every day, this is your formative assessment that's being done. So, like, you, if you do it three days a week, you do it two days a week, this could be your formative assessment at the end of the lesson. So, and if you do it the way, like, you have them hand in their journals, already open so that it saves you time to flip through to the entries. It'll take you five minutes, ten minutes to look at it, depending upon the question that you're asking. But it's really invaluable because you can really find out which little guys aren't getting it. So. Does it matter if it's a separate book? Like, I mean, right now I'm doing questions like that with just their duotang. Mm -hmm. And they're just doing their entry in their duotang. Is that all right as well? Or does it, should it have to be a separate kind of like a little guide? See, that's the thing. Some teachers just do it in their math, their math, their math mm -hmm. books, sorry, yeah. because they don't want to have to hand out journals, hand out notebooks. But I think that if you did one every so often, Joanne, that you would have it even on a piece of paper. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but um, portfolios or, or something, like if you just had a snapshot and you had, um, like, if you had a journal question that was pertaining to, like, N1, you could have them just submit something so that you have something to gauge them on and then keep tracking it. They could just do it on a piece of loose. Yeah, and then you could just put it somewhere and keep it for your formative assessment. I don't think you necessarily have to have like a half book. I, I prefer it myself just because I like to have that. Now later on when Mark presents, he's going to show some of you, it's way beyond my level. It's, he's going to do, Kate, he's doing it with your classes, isn't he, Caitlin? The journals, the math yeah, journals, he's going, the he's, We're going to start that yeah. eventually, not right away. And I actually was going to talk to him about, I'd like to do it as, um, like, not do it as a date, because we do our math journals, like the paper and pencil math journal, but what I'm thinking to do is, using our blog to have the math journal class would be a constructed response. Yep. So they have all week, like they have until Friday to complete their constructed response either at home or in school. Yep. And then on Friday I'll go through them and look and see what they've got and see who's who understands how to create a constructed response mm -hmm. and who maybe needs a little bit of guided time mm -hmm. to realize how to do like to take out information and then word it properly. Yeah. Because I know that it's important in the fifth grade. 
Well, he also, especially. and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but he created like a wiki space, like as an example to show you guys, if you put a couple journal questions out, it's kind of good homework, you know, for them to do. And then parents can see their journal entries, and it's kind of neat that way. So we'll talk more about that. But is there a set of these, Tracy? Like I remember going to an in-service with Ron the Daltrop. Yep. And um, she was talking about putting the, did she ever put them on the portal, like sample journal questions, kind of? There are some on the portal. Now, the only problem is when Rhonda did put them on the portal, mm -hmm. that was right when grade two was becoming the new, new curriculum. it was curriculum yeah. implementation year for two, okay. five, and eight that year. Okay. Um, I'm working on it, okay. slowly but surely, and I do have a small bank. I have more grades three, four, five, because that's been our focus for the last two years. Okay. But really, all the, the four elementary math mentors were trying to put more on the portal for K-2 okay. to help yeah. support you guys because it's kind of been neglected. Or is there like a good book or anything that we could... So yeah. this is an excellent book here. It's called Good Questions for Math Teaching. We have that. Do you yeah. have it? Yeah. yeah. I actually have that. You kind of have to read through it to find yeah. out how it pertains to your curriculum. Yeah. Okay. We all have it. And uh, this, would Every grade for grade, it, this would only be for grade five. This is good questions. Oh, that one. This is a really good one for grade five. Somewhere it's it's way better. Yeah. So if you want to borrow this one, Caitlin, I yeah, can use it. Any hat these? Are you? Then there's also this one here, and it's differentiating. <laughs> it's um, it's open-ended questions so that you can, for your higher level and your lower level. So well, there are I, I like Tracy, yeah, I'm dating my classroom experience here, but I found years ago when I had the interactions books had a lot of like questions that were made for good journal questions. So would there be issues with using them if they're still around? Interactions. And you asked me about the item bank. Mm -hmm. you did ask you about that. Too. The mm -hmm. item bank. Yeah. It's still good. Yeah. The only problem is that it's not now, it's not correlated with the new curriculum. Mm -hmm. But there are some good things in here. The other best place to find the journal entries too is the curriculum document under the assessment strategies, the individual group whole class assessment strategies. They have questions in there. And the best thing that I always tell teachers when they're looking for journal questions is to go to the achievement indicators. And if you look at the achievement indicators, those are those are the targets that they should be hitting, you know, to achieve that, that that learning outcome. You can make a journal question up from there. I've used a lot, like a lot of the questions that I've used are like either for teaching or for journal questions are straight from the curriculum, do curriculum document. And you can take those questions, and if you don't like the numbers, if you think they're too high at the beginning, you can change them and then work your way up. Yep. So I find, like, I'm in the curriculum document almost every day before I start my lesson. Like, whatever my focus is, I'm looking at the questions that they have. It what kind of guides your instruction, right? Yeah, it really does. And the other place that you can find it, too, is in Math Makes Sense, the ABC123, those reflect questions that are in the lessons. And then also the Canva Finders. Believe it or not, there's really this is only for kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three. But the camera finders also have really good journal questions in there. Especially for like the kindergarten and grade one right now, because I find like it's hard to get them writing and getting and getting into that. So they have some like, oral tasks that you can put up on the on the smart board and you can, you can do it as a sharing group. So my whole thing was, is I was spending a whole lot of time doing math journals, and, and I didn't have a lot of marks. So I wanted to have a mark associated with some of their journal entries. So we, we have this general scoring rubric where it's very simple. Either if they handed it in, they have a zero, they didn't understand the concept. They're getting there, or they got it. So if we went back to that example of how, what's that number, 246, that student obviously does not have his number sense. He's getting there, but he's got a ways to go. So I would score that as a one. So if you only score it as a zero, one, two, it's pretty easy, easy going that way. The one other thing I want to mention about math journals is that you don't have to write a big long letter to them when they put a journal entry in there, but you have to kind of indicate that you have seen it, even if you put a sticker on there that says super job or you know whatever, but just make sure you recognize that you've looked at it because it's their journal and they want that kind of recognition. I also tell them Tracy a lot of times, and I don't know if other people do this, a lot of times when, I, when we're moving on to a new question, I always tell them to go back and look to see if I put comments on things that they've done in the past. Like, um, I put comments sometimes, come see me, so that they know, okay, I need to talk, like, we need to talk. And it's also a reminder for them, because it doesn't put the onus on you, that they'll come and say, oh, you wanted me to come see you about this, so I could stand on there. 